I'm delighted you've joined us for another one of our studies in our Sabbath School Lessons on the Great Controversy. I've had the privilege of writing these lessons, and so it's a particularly meaningful to me. The Great Controversy is a term that we use to describe the conflict between good and evil, Christ and Satan. It's a term that we use to describe this controversy that began in heaven millenniums ago and will never end till sin is finally eradicated from the universe and God ushers in the new heavens and the new earth. Let's summarize what we've looked at at the first two lessons. In the first lesson, we studied about Satan's fall from heaven, the origin of the great controversy, and we looked at the fact that God has given every human being the power of choice. We saw that how God gave the angels in heaven the power of choice, and every angel had to decide whose side they would be on, Christ or Satan's. We discovered as well that God gave Adam and Eve that power of choice, in the Garden of Eden. And we've looked that down through the ages, God has given men and women the power of choice. Why? Because God doesn't want robots. He doesn't want mere machines to serve him. He wants a loving response from beings who appreciate his character and respond to his love. We noticed that when Adam and Eve fell, God immediately gave the promise of the Messiah. And although millenniums passed, Jesus eventually came. He lived the life we should have lived, faced temptations, Satan's temptations head on, died the death we should have died. And Jesus rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, and is our great high priest. Everything we need, we have in Christ, the forgiveness, the grace, the mercy, the power, the strength. So we looked at that largely in our first lesson. In our second lesson, we looked at the destruction of Jerusalem. We ask the question, if God is so good, why did he allow the destruction of Jerusalem? Why did he allow so many innocent people, men, women, children, to die? And we discovered that God did everything he could to save them, everything he could to redeem them. He sent prophet after prophet to warn Israel, to lead Israel back to him in times of rebellion. And also he sent a message of warning to his people, the Christians living in Jerusalem, that when they saw the Roman army surround the city, that they should flee and leave, which many did, and uh, no Christians died in the devastation that took place in Jerusalem. So in every aspect, God has revealed himself as a God of love. We looked also in the lesson last week, in our second lesson, that the Christian church, armed with the power of the living Christ, went out and changed the world. As Paul says in Colossians 1 verse 23, the gospel has preached every creature under heaven. We saw the magnificent growth of the Christian church, and it grew primarily for three reasons. First, each of those disciples were committed Christians, and they knew Christ personally. Secondly, they proclaimed Christ, and thirdly, they lived Christ. And we looked at the fact that during some of the great plagues in the second and third century, the Christians went out into the streets, ministered to people, and when non-Christians saw their unselfish love, these non-Christians are so impressed that they too joined the ranks of Christianity. Now the Christian church is growing. If you were Satan, what would you do about it? If you, if you were the devil, how would you try to stop the Christian church from growing? You've tried persecution, that hasn't worked. You've tried force and oppression. You've tried imprisonment and torture and death, that hasn't worked. The church continues to grow. Might not you try to bring pagan practices into the church and what you didn't accomplish through deception, you might accomplish through compromise? Today's lesson, this week's lesson, is called Light That Shines in Darkness. On Sunday's lesson, we look at compromise, Satan's subtle strategy. There are two texts in contrast. First, John 14, verse 6. In John 14, 6, Jesus is speaking and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says, I'm the way, the way of salvation, the way of forgiveness and mercy and strength and power, the way to eternity. Then he says, I'm the truth. We find Jesus the way, our Savior, so that we can walk in his truth, so we can live his life. Jesus is the truth. Everything he says is truth because 
He is the author of truth. So Jesus is the one whose words are faithful and true according to Scripture. Now, if you look at what it says in John chapter 8, verse 44, you really have the antithesis of this, the, the opposite of this. John 8, verse 44. The Scripture says, You are your father the devil. The desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Because he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he's a liar and the father of it. So you have Jesus, the author of truth, and you have Satan, the author of lies. You have Jesus, the author of what is right and honest and upright, and Satan, the author of that of falsehood. You have Satan, the one who is trying to deceive. Uh, notice here uh, in Sunday's lesson, the way I've worded it. In contrast, this second paragraph under compromise Satan's subtle strategy. In contrast, Satan is a liar. That's in contrast to Jesus, the author of truth and the father of lies. He's prepared to use lies, deceit, misinformation, and distortion of the truth to lead God's people astray. He deceived Eve in Eden by distorting truth, creating doubt, and blatantly at denying that what God said Satan's statement, you shall not surely die, in the context of eating the fruit was a clear contradiction of what God said. Throughout the centuries, Satan has used the same strategy. He undermines confidence in God's word, contradicts God's revealed will, distorts scripture, and at times misquotes the Bible. What is God's antidote for truth? What is God's remedy well, what is God's antidote, rather, for error? What is God's remedy for the lies, the distortions of Satan? How does God deal with that? Well, Proverbs 23, verse 23 will be helpful. Proverbs 23 and verse 23 helps us. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The antidote for error is truth. And as we open our hearts and come seeking God, pleading with him to reveal truth, he gives us wisdom to discern truth. He gives us instruction to know what truth is. And he gives us understanding to follow it. So here you have, we plead for truth. God gives us wisdom so we can discern it. We can discern truth from error. He gives us instruction so we can know what truth is. And he gives us understanding so we can follow truth. You remember Jesus said in John 17, verse 17, sanctify them through thy word, thy word is truth. What does it mean to sanctify? It means to set apart for holy use. So Jesus is saying here, set my people apart. Satan's going to bring in compromise. Satan's going to bring in falsehood. Satan's going to bring in deceit. But sanctify my people through the truth. John 8, verse 32, Jesus says, I am the truth. He says in John 8, verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall do what make you free. The truth makes us free from Satan's errors and Satan's falsehood. In the book, Great Controversy, page 51, we read, and this is the note on the bottom of Sunday's lesson, Satan well knew that the Holy Scriptures would enable men to discern the deceptions and withstand his power. It was by the word that even the Savior of the world had resisted his attacks. At every assault, Satan presented the shield of eternal truth, saying, It is written. Now the last few sentences of the page. The people were forbidden to read it, that's to read the Bible during the Middle Ages, or to have it in their houses. And unprincipled precepts and prelates interpreted its teachings to sustain their pretensions. Thus the Pope came to be the most universally acknowledged as the vicegerent of God on earth, endowed with authority over church and state. So here's what Satan's goal. Satan's goal was to hide the scriptures from people, the popular church at that time felt that the lay people, the average populace, the average church member was too ignorant to understand the Bible. So the Bible was read only by priests and prelates and it had to be understood through 
the prism of their own knowledge, their own wisdom. It had to be understood through the channel of their own thinking. And so Satan distorts truth, and it comes to the channel of a hierarchy, a clergy uh, in the papal period, and Jesus is the author of all truth. On Monday's lesson, we read the prediction that distortions would come into the Christian church in those early centuries. Now, you may remember the story. The Apostle Paul met with the elders from the church of Ephesus. Paul had left. He was traveling back to uh, Jerusalem. And as he was traveling, he stopped at a place called Miletus. Miletus is an amazing city today for its archaeological finds there. It has been a well-preserved city. I visited the city of Miletus. And uh, here, the Apostle Paul met with the elders from Ephesus. They came. They knew Paul's boat would be stopping there uh, for a little while. And they were anxious to hear their last words from the Apostle Paul. And uh, Paul speaks to the elders. The, his words to them were an admonition for the church in the early centuries, and they're certainly an admonition for us today. Acts 20, we begin there with verse 27. Paul says, I've not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Paul said, I, I've been honest. I have shared not part of God's counsel, not a little bit of it, but all of God's counsel. Therefore, take heed to yourselves. What does it mean to take heed? Be careful. Understand. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the flock of God which he's purchased with his own blood. For I know this, Paul says, I know this, there's no guess. I know this, that after my departing, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. In other words, there's going to be persecutions from without. Savage wolves are going to come in. They're not going to spare the flock. There'll be vicious persecution that takes place. That took place under the pagan Roman Empire and the government. Verse 30, also among your own selves will men rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. In other words, right among yourself, there's going to be apostasy. There's going to be perverse things that are spoken. Then it says, therefore, watch and remember that for three years I warned you of these things. Verse 32, now, brethren, I commend you to God in the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. Paul says, look, there are going to be false teachers that come into the church. They're going to speak error. They're going to replace truth with falsehood. But watch and remember, I told you this. Build up your flock with the word of God. I love what it says in the book, Great Controversy, none but those whose minds are fortified with scripture will stand for the, through the final crisis. So this is the time to build up our minds with the words of scripture. Also, here in 2 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul tells us very clearly just why some people have uh, accepted the lies of Satan. Why do some people accept the falsehoods of Satan? We find it here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says in verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, science, and lying wonders. So Satan will try to deceive through spiritualism and false miracles and emotionalism. Then he says, with all unrighteousness of deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. A couple of things here. Why were these people deceived? Because they received not the love of the truth. They didn't love truth. They didn't seek for truth as for hid treasure. Their hearts, you know, Jeremiah says, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And here, Paul says they love pleasure more than they love the things of God or eternity. And so as the result of that, they were vulnerable. They were open to Satan's lies. 
And how are we safeguarded? What is it that safeguards us? Tuesday's lesson points that out. John 17, verse 15 to 17, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. We are set apart or sanctified by thy word. And remember, we read Acts 20, verse 32, we're built up by the word of God. I'd like you to look at the note on Tuesday's lesson. Right below the section that asks you to compare John 17, 15 to 17 in Acts 20, 32. The Bible is the infallible revelation of God's will. It presents heaven's plans for humanity's salvation. Since all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, profitable, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction in righteousness. The Bible presents, reveals God's infinite love in the light of the great controversy. It also expo exposes Satan's satanic delusions and reveals the devil's deception. Satan hates the word of God and has done everything possible throughout the centuries to destroy its influence. So in modern thinking, there are many who say, oh, the Bible is really uh, what people thought about God. And uh, it's simply their opinions of who God is. And the Bible is largely conditioned by culture, really. If that were so, why should we pay attention to it? Not at all. The Bible is God's unerring, infinite, eternal revelation of truth. We come to the Bible, and as we take this sacred book in our hands, we recognize that it is God's antidote for the errors that Satan wants to bring in in the last days of earth's history. Um, Wednesday's lesson looks at human reasoning apart from scripture. The Holy Spirit works through our minds. He invites us to explore the mysteries of the universe. As someone has aptly stated, as Christians, we don't check our brains at the door of the church. Nevertheless, the brilliance of human reasoning alone is incapable of discovering the divine truths of scripture. Truth is not a matter of human opinion, it's a matter of divine revelation. Why do you think that human reasoning alone, unaided by the Holy Spirit, is incapable of understanding Scripture? Here's why. Remember the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. So because we have a fallen nature, we distort truth and cannot fully understand truth without the guidance of the Holy Spirit. In fact, remember in Proverbs 16, verse 25, it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of what? Death. The way seems right. The person thinks it's right, but it's not right at all. Um, in Judges 21, verse 25, it says, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all, like, all we like sheep have, have gone astray. So if you look at human nature, unaided by the Holy Spirit, you look at human reasoning uh, when it's not guided and shaped and molded by God and Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, when you, when you see the human being's own attempt to reason and decipher and disseminate scripture unaided by guidance from the Holy Spirit, we come to wrong conclusions, right? Notice, um, I, I tell an interesting illustration there. A few years ago, my wife and I were, were traveling and uh, we had a stopover in Switzerland and uh, our flight connection didn't connect to the next morning. We get into Switzerland late at night, we were flying on. I think it was to the Middle East, but we had a stopover at a hotel. And our hotel was not right by the airport, but it was on the edge of a forest. So my wife and I love to walk. And so I said to my wife, let's go walking. And I said, we have a few hours before sunset and we get out in the forest and we walked and we walked and we walked and we walked. And we went one mile, two miles, three miles, probably four miles. And I said, you know, the, my wife said, you know the way back? I said, absolutely, don't worry. Are you sure you know the way back? Oh yeah, I know the way back. We go right, we go left, we go by these trees, we go by this little uh, brook, whatever it was. And as we walked, the further we got in, sun setting, I said, okay, we better head back, we head back. And pretty soon I realized I was hopelessly lost. 
Now, I, my human reasoning thought I knew the way. My human reasoning thought I can certainly find the way back, but I was totally lost. I saw two other hikers, and I was by this time a little nervous. My heart was beating a little faster. Faster not only because I was embarrassed that I didn't know the way back, I was embarrassed that uh, my wife was right all the time. I was, but I also my heart beat fast because I knew that we didn't want to spend the night in the forest. And once it got dark, I was, we, were, we were in real trouble. I saw two hikers and I said, hey, do you know where such and such a way back is this hotel? They said, look, sir, you're about five miles from it, but there's a main road right up here. Our car is there, we'll take you back. Oh, I was so happy. They drove us about the five miles back to the hotel. Look, my human reason didn't, reasoning did not keep me from getting lost, but I needed a guide. And the guide, sure, I was sure happy because that guide got us back to the hotel, which was our temporary residence for that night. Human reasoning unaided by the Holy Spirit won't get us home to heaven. But when we place our minds, our human reasoning in God's hands and ask him to guide us, ask him to direct us, ask him to enlighten us, our Heavenly Father, through His Spirit, will get us home. Um, I want, I want to take a look at the last paragraph on Wednesday's lesson. God has not left us alone on our journey from earth to heaven. The Holy Spirit points us to the sacred scriptures that lead us homeward. Truth and error, right and wrong, good and evil. These can be correctly understood only in the light of God's word. That which contradicts God and His word is error, and error is always dangerous. That which is in harmony with God is truth and goodness. How important that we make the Bible the final arbiter of truth for us. There is a battle for the mind that's going on. We find that in Thursday's lesson. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, verse 4. We find here... 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and we're chapter 4 verse 3 and 4 3 through 6 actually 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3 chapter 3 through chapter 4 verse 3 to 6 but even if our gospel is veiled it's veiled to those that are perishing why is it veiled to those that are perishing because they love not the truth and therefore they can't see truth if you love truth it's not veiled if your mind is guided by the spirit whose minds the god of this age has blinded who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of christ who's the image of god would shine in them why is it that their minds are blinded that they have this veil because they don't believe for we do not preach ourselves but we preach christ jesus the lord for it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who shone in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God is shines light out of our darkness. When we come to the word of God and say, God, whatever you want me to do, I want to do it. God, my heart is open to you. God, my mind is open to you. God, I want to be guided by your spirit. His spirit will guide us into all truth. We need not be deceived by the falsehood of Satan. How did Satan try to infiltrate the church in the third and fourth, fifth centuries, particularly by introducing falsehood into the church. But those whose minds were captured by the word, captivated by the word of God stood firm. Today, the devil at times tries to use modern scholarship to discount the Bible. But as we come to the scripture and say, Jesus, your word is the guide of my life. Your word illuminates my darkness. Your word casts light on the road ahead. As we come with an honest heart, all the demons in hell do not have the power. They don't have the power to cast us out of God's presence. And in the presence of God, there is light and truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that many in the early church heeded Paul's counsel and they faithfully followed your truth, your word. They were built up by the word. We thank you for that. Now, Lord, as we continue to study these lessons, fill our mind with your word and may your word shine brightly in our lives so that we can have the impact on the world around us so that Jesus can come soon. In Christ's name, amen.